opportunity to recognize each one of our graduates. We'll start with kindergarten, and we have Ms. Kinsley Lancaster, and she graduated from kindergarten at Polk Central Elementary School. <laughs> Next will be our elementary school, and we'll go with Ms. Brittany Hall from Tryon Elementary. McKenna Jones also graduated from elementary school from Tryon Elementary. <laughs> Moving into our middle school, we have Morgan Stott from Polk County Middle School. <laughs> Next is Callie Tesnier from Polk County Middle School. Next is our high school graduates, Sammy Furby from Poe County High School. She will be attending Gardner-Webb University this year. <laughs> Next is Christian Phipps she will, from Poe County High School. She will be attending Isothermal Community College this year. Next is Victoria Swain. She's from Polk County High School as well, and she will be also attending Gardner-Webb University. <laughs> Next, we'll go into our college graduates. We have Miss Lindsay Allison. She completed her Bachelor of Science birth through kindergarten at Western Carolina University. <laughs> Next um, is Miss Kelly Klovac from Lees McCray College, Bachelor of Science in Nursing. <laughs> Next is Mr. Sean McKegg from Fayetteville Technical Community College with a degree for North Carolina Funeral Director Diploma. <laughs> Next is Ms. Darcy Williams with an Associate of Arts from Isothermal Community College. At this time, we'll ask Ms. Brenda Koval if she'll come forward and accept on the behalf of Rachel Koval Base from Liberty University. She graduated with a business administration marketing minor clothing textiles. <laughs> and I don't believe Harold or Bunny, either one, are here. I don't see them, but their daughter, Nikki Williams, also graduated from Appalachian State University with a degree of Bachelor's of Science in Exercise Science. So, <laughs> and that is all of our graduates for this year. Let's give them all a hand. I'll give it to Ms. Clyde. <laughs> Children's Church today, Tammy? Yes. Okay. Children, if y'all will go ahead with Miss Tammy. I need my Bible. <laughs> yeah. If you have a Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 4. And again, I just want to say we're proud of our graduates, all of them. And um, you've accomplished a, a really great task, an incredible task. And um, we, we love you very much, and we thank God for what he has done and is continuing to do in your life and what he will do in your life. Now, this is a special day for these grads and for um, their families. And I know for those high schoolers, they're ready for Wednesday. They get to walk across the, the big stage. Um, but no matter the stage and the degree that you receive, um, as you finish one school and go on to the next, or if you're finished with uh, college and, and you're going on into the career field, you have to remember you're still a child of God and you still belong to his family and you're still making your mark. So when Wednesday comes or after, you know, you've already graduated, when all those, those days happen, um, you're still making that impact. You're always making an impact, setting an example. 
And so I want to ask them, I want to ask everybody this as we study today, but especially uh, our graduates. Um, up to this point, what example have you set? Up to this point, what mark, lasting mark, have you made on this world? You know, every, every soul in this room um, is making a mark on the world as we speak. But you're also making a mark for eternity as well. So I want to ask you, what mark are you making? And parents, what mark have you made on your children? As they think about, as you think about graduation um, coming up this week, I'm convinced that if they're going to be, you think about these, these children, if, you, if they're going to be an example of godliness, then they must see an example of godliness within their homes too. All right, so consider these things as we celebrate graduation today. What example am I setting? What mark am I making? Um, over the years, countless men and women have made a lasting mark uh, on the world, whether for Christ or for self. And I'm going to share with you just a, a few of those examples. How many of you uh, know who Robert Oppenheimer was? You know who he was? Um, David, is it David Bone? Um, how about Albert Einstein? Franklin, Franklin D. Roosevelt? Okay, there's a bunch of names that are on this page. Uh, uh, Niels Bohr, um, for instance. Do you know what all those men have in common, all those people have in common? They came together for a project in 1939 called the Manhattan Project. Together, these men, and, and I know some of these names that came up, you, they're very respectable names. Together, they created the atomic bomb and ushered into the world nuclear, nuclear warfare. What kind of mark? Are you making? Do you know the name Garrett Morgan? You're like, I didn't come here to learn school again. <laughs> you know Garrett Morgan? He was an African American inventor. In 1923, out of a need for safety on the roads, he invented the first ever traffic light to help uh, prevent accidents and traffic jams. And there were only three lights then, just there as there are now, but not the same colors. There was, uh, there was stop, go, and everybody stopped. So there wasn't no caution light. Okay. His mark on the world better today, but what kind of mark are you making? What about this one? Vladimir Kosma Zworkin. He's a Russian born in America. Um, Philo, Philo Taylor Farnsworth from Utah, and then John Logie Baird. Each of these men are given credit to inventing something that revolutionized the world in the television. Okay? They, their invention was a small machine that transmitted pictures and moving images onto a screen. They made a mark on the world, didn't they? For positive and for negative, right? What kind of mark are you making? From 1933 to 1945, a German terrorist, dictator, and politician arose that made a lasting impact on the world. He was at the center of World War II in Europe um, and the Holocaust. He was a racially motivated uh, man behind genocide of over 5.5 million Jews and then millions of other victims. His name was Adolf Hitler, and his Nazi regime are responsible for almost 25 million deaths through World War II. He made his mark on the world, wouldn't you say? What kind of mark are you making? Alexander Joy Cartwright. Do you know that name? In 1845, he invented a game with a bat, ball, and a glove running around this diamond called Shaped Bases, two teams of nine men trying to keep one another from scoring. We call it baseball. He made his mark on the world, didn't he? Sir Alexander Fleming, in 1928, he invented a medicine that killed a number of disease-causing bacteria. The medicine's called penicillin. He made his mark on the world. What kind of mark are you making? And then one of my favorite stories of making a mark comes from Alfred Nobel. He was the inventor of dynamite. And his brother died, uh, Ludwig died in 1888. But when they put out his obituary, they actually put Alfred Nobel's name on the obituary. And this is what it said. Uh, it said, Dr. Alfred Nobel, who became rich by finding ways to kill more people faster than ever before, died yesterday. <laughs> his heart was broken. And so he, and, uh, he came up with um, uh, the Nobel Prize, um, which awards five different, um, five different people every year for making lasting contributions on the world. And then my all-time favorite, if you ever heard the name John Wycliffe, okay, you're going to find out who he was today. In the 1380s, he's an Oxford professor. He was a school uh, uh, th scholar, theologian. 
He produced dozens of English language manuscript copies of the Bible. And so he took it from the Latin Vulgate, and then he put it into a common version of the Scripture. So you can thank God for John Wycliffe for having an English translation of the Word. He was the first one to translate the Bible into English today. Again, made his, made his impact on the world, made his mark on the world. What kind of mark are you making? Now, there are countless others. Actually, everybody in this room is making an impact some way, somehow. You're, you're leaving your mark as, as I speak. But I want, I want to speak to, to you today, um, especially for everybody, about being children that exemplify Jesus, that make their mark for Christ. You know, we can aspire to be all kinds of things, and everybody here has got their plans, right? Everybody here is going towards something, especially these graduates, as they get ready to, to go to college or into the career field. You've already got your mind made up of what you're going to aspire to be. You know, you can pursue the med field or you can pursue the battlefield or the ball field or the law field or the ministry field, anywhere really. But many of you have already made up your minds as what you're going to do. But my prayer is that as you pursue those interests, that you pursue Jesus in the midst of those interests, okay? that you would set an example with your life that leaves a lasting mark on society for him. That means that we must make this choice today, an eternal choice, will I serve Jesus with my life? And you can make your mark on the world in him. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is writing a, a very young pastor um, named Timothy, and um, this is one of Paul's last three letters that he would write before he would be imprisoned and killed. Um, in Rome, and Paul was telling Timothy, you know, as a, as a pastor, he needed to be faithful to what he was doing. He needed to be devoted. He needed to be gifted and spirit-filled and led and God-fearing um, because he, too, was going to make his mark on the world for, for Christ. And so this is what's happening. Timothy's pastor in this church, and they're being attacked from all kinds of angles. All right, from, you, you name it, it was happening within this, this area called Ephesus. And what was happening is there were these false teachers that were rising up. And they were starting to, to, to come into and invade the church. And so their, their teachings were off. And then, um, and then uh, there was discord in, in the way that the people worshipped. And there were issues over leadership of the church. And there was personal and public godliness that was in question. All kinds of trouble happening for Timothy's life. And, and this young man was given the responsibility to shepherd this flock. And so Paul writes this letter and he encourages him. And, and, and he tells him here in, in verse 12, he's like, you can be an example. No matter if you're young, you can leave your mark, okay, for, for the Lord Jesus Christ. So in chapter 4, Paul reminds Timothy that in the latter days, talking about today, the latter days, all kinds of evil is going to rise up. You look at the headlines this week, <laughs> all kinds of things are happening, right? In the latter days. And, and false teachers would, would come to question the rule of God and the lordship of Christ and his death and resurrection. And people were just choosing all kinds of sin over the Lord. And Paul said, in the latter days, some people will give themselves over to false teaching. And he said, in the latter days, some, some people would, uh, would, would abstain from God and then they, they would abstain from his creation. And then, but, but he calls Timothy, he says, you be a good minister of Christ. You be nourished in the Word. You grow up in the Lord, and, 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 you, and you train these folks. And don't give in to everything that the world's throwing at you. Don't, don't give in to those old wives' tales is what he called it. And, um, in other words, false teachings, deniers of the Word. He said, be strengthened by being godly. And so Paul tells Timothy, you know, there's going to be a lot of people in your life that look down on you. And you know that. There's going to be a lot of people that, that doubt you. And there's going to be a lot of people that are out there that are, going to, that are going to put you down because you're young. And they're going to say that you can't do this. Or they're going to say that you don't, you don't have the experience. And you're, you know, they're going to put into question your calling and your, you know, your, your, your ministry and your credibility. In the Timothy's days, it, the way it worked, if you didn't have age, you didn't have respect. Right? So respect as a, at a young age, it'd have to be earned among the people. And Paul said, Timothy, don't let them despise you. Don't let, them, don't let them deter you from, from serving the Lord. Think, think little of you. Write you off because you can be an example in godliness. So he says, set an example, Timothy. Set an example. And you know what that word example means? It means, uh, it comes from the word tupas. Everybody say tupas. Tupas. It means struck. It means a stamp. It means a mark. It means a scar. It means to be a model for imitation, a pattern, a print. Paul tells Timothy, don't let anybody look down on you. 
but be a tupas, right? Be a mark. Make your mark, okay, on this world for Christ. Age is something that you can't help. You can't help that you're 18 years old. You can't help that you're 25 years old. You can't, you can't help that you just graduated college or high school or you're going into high school. You can't help that. You can't help that. You can't help your age, but you can, but you can leave your mark for Christ. There's no age limit on that. You can, set, you can set the example now. Now, let me ask you this as we look at this passage. What about your life says that I'm making an impact on the world? What about your life says that? Whole church. What about your life right now says that I'm making an impact on the world for the Lord Jesus? You're going to leave a mark, I promise you. You're going to leave a mark, a lasting impact on somebody's life somewhere along the road. Will you leave a legacy for Christ? What will you do? Let's read this verse together. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Would you stand as we read the word today? 1 Timothy 4, 12. After Paul warns Timothy about all the things that are going to be happening, what he needs to do, he says, Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Lord, would you speak to our hearts today? And thank you, Father, for these graduates and for their families. We celebrate what um, they've accomplished, uh, Lord, but we also look forward to, to continuing to see what you're going to do in their lives and through their families and, and what you're leading them to do. And, I, and, and the main thing that I just want to want to pray over these students um, is that they would continue to pursue Jesus, that if they would make a, a lasting mark on this world, you know, all these, all these things that we aspire to, those are important. Those are good. And all these men and women that we read about today, that's important. That, that's good. Some of them. Um, but, Lord, the, the greatest mark that we can make is a mark that says I glorified Jesus with my life, that I followed his lead, that I, that I, that I looked to his word and that I trusted in him, and that I, that I modeled before others a person that had truly been changed by you. So, so Father, just, just guide us in the world today. And, and I do pray that you would make a lasting impact on our hearts as we study. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, Paul tells Timothy how he can be that example, all right, in this one verse. I've got three things I want you to get. First one is this. Paul tells Timothy, make your mark first by being careful with your words. Make your mark first. By being careful with your words. I want you to look at verse 12. Let no one despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in what? What's the word there? In word. Be an example in what? The word. Be an example in, in word. Now, I touched a bit on this last Sunday night. We talked about imitating Christ through, through holiness. Um, but you guys didn't hear this part. A lot of them didn't, especially these graduates. They were in youth group and things like that. Um, but but the, the point of this is Paul saying, be careful with your words. Your words have a lasting impact, right? They do. And they're powerful. Um, I want you to listen to some of his quotes about words. One person said, handle your words carefully, for they have more power than atom bombs. Uh, Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man speaks, so he is. Cubulus Sirius said, speech is the mirror of the soul. Jesus said that out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speaks. So what's in your heart comes out of your mouth. Um, Ann Lander said, the trouble with talking too fast is you may say something you haven't thought of yet. <laughs> <laughs> Oliver Wendell Holmes said, speak clearly. If you speak at all, carve every word before you let it fall. Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Words are powerful. And, and I shared this with our adults last Sunday night. Words are a lot like toothpaste, Okay. Uh, you ever tried to squeeze toothpaste back into the tube before? You can't, can you? You should try it. <laughs> it's actually fun. Okay. You, you can't get your words back either. All right. Once, you, once you've said it, you've already made your mark. Okay. It's already been, it's already been imprinted. They make an impact. A, spur, a person's speech reflects what's in here. All right, and whether it be pure, whether it be impure, godly, ungodly, you hang out for somebody for a while, spend some time with somebody for a while, and just listen to the way that they talk. All right, it won't take you long to figure out what the state of their soul is. It won't take you long to figure out what their focus is in life. It won't take you long to figure out if they have credibility 
or integrity based on what they say. Do you build up? Do you tear down? Do you speak life into somebody or do you speak death into somebody? Being that Paul was ministering to Timothy, speaking to Timothy, it was important that Timothy as a minister would speak truth so that he could walk in his calling as a man of God and a minister so it'd be valid. The same is true for us. Listen, there, there are no exceptions, all right, to the rule. Timothy's a pastor, but yet you're still a minister of the gospel too. All right, as graduates, as students, you're, you're still a minister of the gospel. Families, we're still ministers of the gospel. So, so it's not fair to just say, well, this just applies to Timothy. Timothy need to be careful with what he said. Whole church, we need to be careful with what we say. All right, our words reflect what's in here. Some come out uh, a couple of years back um, called words. Listen to, listen to these lyrics. They've made me feel like a p- prisoner. They've made me feel set free. They've made me feel like a criminal. They've made me feel like a king. They lifted my heart to places I've never been. They've dragged me down back to where I began. Words can build you up. Words can bring you down, break you down. Start a fire in your heart or put it out. Let my words be life. Let my words be truth. I don't want to say a word unless it points the world back to you. Let the words I say be the sound of your grace. I don't want to say a word unless it points the world back to you. Hello. (laughs) How true is that? Paul says to Timothy, and Paul says to us today, be careful with your words. You You want to set an example? You want to leave your mark? Watch what you say. I'm always drawn to what James said, you know, about the power of your words. James chapter 3 said that tongues can cause a wildfire. Isn't that true? You know, just a small spark started fire. He said that our tongues are untamable too. And we can tame all kinds of things, and all kinds of animals, all kinds of things. But, but the tongue cannot be tamed. Full, it's full of deadly poison. Words can corrupt an entire person. So, so with our words, you know, with what we say, you can worship in one sentence, but in the next sentence you can bring, you can bring a curse to God. You, you can speak negatively of him. You can, you can dishonor him. You can lift others up, but in the same sentence you can put somebody down. Isn't that something? You know, our, our words are powerful. You make your mark by your words. I'm telling you, you can remember all kinds of things about all kinds of people. And people say that, you know, that you, you'll forget their accomplishments, but you'll never forget that encounter with that person who spoke negatively of you. You don't forget words, do you? You don't forget them. They're hard to forget. People are listening to what we say. So the question today is this, do we honor God with our words or do we curse the Lord? Are we an encouragement to others with our words or a hazard? Timothy was told, be an example. And it's, it's, so, it's so funny that he said it first, be an example in words. The first thing he said, well, I wonder why. He said, speak words of compassion, love, encouragement with the word of God. He was to make much of Christ with his speech, understanding that he would either draw people to Christ or draw people away from Christ. I'll give you an example here. A couple months back, um, I, was, uh, I was sharing Christ with a family, and um, I was inviting them to be a part of our church. They said, you can come and worship with us. And um, the young lady and her husband, they shared with me how they used to be involved, you know, in a, in a local church. They used to come, and, um, but the pastor of the church they attended pretty much used his words one Sunday he told them that um, if they disagreed with him, then they disagreed with God. And he's kind of boast, it's kind of a boastful thing to say, and it really impacted them. And they lost a loved one. He said later on, after that had happened, they had lost a loved one um, that was really close to their family. And, um, and, and once again, the words of the pastor were so destructive to them. Um, he gave them the kind of impression. He, he told them that they needed to get over their loss, that they couldn't do anything about it, and, um, and I know why he said it, and I know how he said it, and I can understand where he's coming from, but as they were sharing with me about their spiritual walk with God or lack thereof, it hit me. Everything that they were, that they were upset about, it had to do with words, things that were said. And the pastor didn't have to say a word to them. He could have just comforted them, right? He didn't have to give his opinion on the matter. They weren't asking for an opinion. They were just, asking, they were just needing some comfort, some, lift, you know, some upliftment. But the words of a pastor had hindered their walk, and his witness is tarnished because of it. And because his witness is tarnished, that whole church's witness is tarnished. And so um, now, now, should they forgive him? Yeah, <laughs> they should. That's kind of silly, you know, to put the whole church down, you know, based on one person's word. But it certainly impacted them, didn't it? 
you know, you're going to leave a lasting mark with what you say. Paul says, be careful. Paul also tells Timothy, make your mark by being Christ-like in the way that you live. Make your mark by being Christ-like. He says, he says here, uh, be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Paul's saying you've got to not just talk, you've got to walk. Okay? You've, got to, you've got to live out that talk. And as we've often heard the phrase, actions speak louder than what? Your words. In this case, Paul affirms that. Timothy was to be Christ-like with his life, that is his conduct. Some of your Bibles may say conversation. That word translated as best, conduct. Okay, The way that you live, it means your, means your walk, it means your lifestyle. Your, ad, your life is to be a billboard, an advertisement for the gospel of Christ. I'm excited about this, going to the beach on Saturday. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> you know, on the way to the beach, you see these signs to the South Carolina line for like 100 miles. Okay. Y'all are jealous, aren't you? Don't be mad. Okay. <laughs> you see these signs that, are, that say like south of the border or something like that, and there's these big neon signs. You see them for like 100 miles in. 15 miles to the world's largest bowl of cereal. You get it right here, south of the border. And then the world's largest toilet bowl right here, five miles away. And then, and then the world's largest beachwear store. And all this way, they're building up this promised land, okay, this great place that you're going to make it to. And then when you get there, it's just an oversized gas station. And, and you've got this billboard that's just building it up, and you're like, this is going to be great. I can't wait to get to the south of the border. And then you're like, wait a second. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What are you advertising with your life? You know, you, you want to make your mark the way we live, and it should be a way that, that, that should, 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 should honor the Christ. You know, we can't just profess Christ. We've got to advertise Christ. We've got to live for Christ. And, and we do that with our works, um, and, our, and our, ways can't, our ways can't deny the way that we talk. So, so others should see Jesus in us. Now, let me ask you this. Suppose I went to the closest friends that you've got. I don't know who they are. But suppose I did. Suppose I went to the closest friends that you have, and I asked them to be truthful about you. If I asked them, what do you think about so-and-so? What, what do you think about them? Do they see Jesus? Do you see Je do I, can I see Jesus in them? Do you see Jesus in them? What would they say to your closest friends, closest people, closest family? If I said, do they see Christ being modeled in their life? What would they say? Do you live your life in a way that says, I love Jesus? I obey his word. We can't just preach Jesus is what Paul is saying to Timothy. You've got to live Jesus, all right? The Bible repeatedly gives exhortations for holy and godly living. Be an example with the way of your conduct. Paul also says, be an example with the way of your compassion. He says, in love, in love, okay, be an example. Now, other versions say charity. That means love to the highest degree. So, so that means that your love should be patient and kind, as 1 Corinthians says, not to be envious. It does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It thinks no evil does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. And love bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So Paul's asking Timothy, will you please, will you please set your mark, make your mark by being Christ-like in your love? Okay? Our love for others is far different, you know, than what our world and culture says that love is supposed to be. Our love in Christ is to be sacrificial. Our love in Christ is to be serving. Our love is to be unconditional. And Jesus even told his disciples, they'll know you belong to me just by the, the way that you love people. So Paul says, Timothy, please be an example with your love. Make your mark. Make your mark. Another thing, be an example with your countenance. That, that verse says in spirit, and a lot of translations don't have that word there. But, but that, that means that our spirit is to be controlled by the spirit of God. Our spirit, okay, our, our, our spirit is to, be, is to reflect the character of, God, character of God. So in other words, Paul's saying, look saved. <laughs> Live like you've got the, the spirit of God inside of you, okay? All right, that li live, like, live like something has changed your life, like God has just invaded your heart, and we, we should be an example in our faith. That is our convictions, too. Okay, our spirits reflect the character of God, but we should also be an example in our faith. That means our convictions. Convictions are your beliefs. Convictions are your, your faith, your morals, your standards, your judgments. Each one of them have to line up with the Word of God. All right? Okay. It's not fair to say, I've got a conviction about this, but yet it doesn't line up with what God says about your conviction. 
That's not a conviction. That's an opinion. All right. What are your convictions? What do you believe? Do you have a firm foundation as you graduate this week? Do you have a firm foundation in Christ as you consider, where is God leading me? What is he leading me to do in the world? Do you have a firm foundation in light of an enemy attack? Because for those that are going on into college, he's coming, okay? It's going to happen. All right, do you know that you believe, what you believe about God's Word? Do you know what you believe about God? Do you know what you believe about living in the flesh versus living in the Spirit? Do you have a firm foundation? Okay, Paul says, Timothy, set an example with your faith. That means, that means your, your convictions. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Therefore, whoever hears these words of mine and does them, I liken him to a man who built his house on a rock. All right, if you're firm in your convictions... It's like you've built your life on this rock. And, and when storms do come, enemy attacks do come, when hard times do come and they beat against that house, your house stands, okay? Your life stands. Why? Because you're built on solid conviction, solid faith. You're founded on the rock. But he says, if you don't, it's like you built your house on sand. And the waves are going to come and the winds are going to blow and the storms are going to howl. And that house is just going to collapse. Paul's telling Timothy, please set an example. Make your mark by being a man of conviction. All right, belief. As you hear God's word, believe God's word. And as you believe God's word, do God's word, it will save your life. It'll save others' lives too. It will forever make a mark and impact for Christ. Live convicted, but make sure your convictions line up with the word of God. Last thing Paul tells Timothy, be an example in your purity. That means your cleanliness. Timothy lived in one of the most immoral places on the face of the earth, okay? People participated in all kinds of sin-filled filth, and, and you name it, it's happening. A lot like America today, okay? Um, uh, we live in a very sin-sick world. And even, and even in, in Polk County, we live in this sin-sick world. And you can imagine that Timothy, day in and day out, Timothy is trying to live for God, but he's being tempted from all, all measures, okay, all, all angles. And Tim, Timothy's tempted to compromise. And, and, and so what does Paul tell him? He says, be pure. Be pure. Set an example with your cleanliness. Commit yourself to be an example of cleanliness. Be holy. 1 Corinthians 6, 13 tells us that the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and, for the, Lord and, for the, and the Lord for the body. In verse 18, it says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? whom you've received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. I put it like this. Whatever you feed your minds, okay, your body, your heart, that's what you become. So, so if we indulge in a lifestyle that, that says, well, I'm just going to be addicted to drugs, okay, that's what you're going to be. And, and if you say, well, I want to indulge in alcohol or, or tobacco use, or if I'm going to become, a, 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 I'm going to become you know, addicted to sexual immorality, that's what we become. That's what we feed on. If you feed yourself with hatred and anger and malice and bitterness with your life, you become that. So, so over the years of your schooling, especially those who are graduating high school and college, over the years, you've been soaking up all kinds of stuff. You know, from, from different people, you've been soaking up everything like a sponge. I wonder what would come out of you after some 13 years of high school, or 13 years of school. What would come out of you if you were squeezed? All right. After four years of college or more, what would come out of you if the temptations of this world tried to squeeze you? Okay, what are you feeding on? I need for you to consider your ways. Do you exemplify Christ with your ways? Do you fill yourself up with Christ? Because if you do... He will be what comes out of your life, all right? He will be the source, the strength, the substance. If we consider him in our ways, our conduct will be like his. Our compassion will be like his, okay? Our countenance will be like his. Our, our convictions, our character, our cleanliness will be like his. But we got to get serious about following him. Last thing today, Paul tells Timothy, make your mark by being committed in your walk. Be committed in your walk. You see, before Timothy was ever told, Timothy, before he was ever said, exemplify godliness in speech and life and love and faith and purity, Paul tells Timothy to be, a, to be in what? He says, be an example. Be an example. Commit yourself to walk with God is what he's saying. 
Commit yourself to walk with God so that others will see that you walk with him. Consecrate yourself. Separate yourself in such a way that your walk says, I, I belong to Jesus. I don't think that Paul would have invested a long time in young Timothy if he, do not, if he did not truly think that Timothy would apply this to his life and do it. You know, Timothy made his mark for Christ. You can be sure of that. And you know what's so incredible about Timothy? Nowhere in the scripture do we read of Timothy failing. Paul sometimes rebuked people for failing. He'd put them out by name. Now, that stinks if you're in the Bible for failing. Okay, but Paul would do that at times. You never, you never hear of Timothy doing that. Now, I know Timothy struggled, okay, where he was. I know he made mistakes. But the point, the point is he walked with God. He made his commitment in his walk and in his worship. And church, we've talked about this before. You're going to commit to worship someone. You're going to do that. You're, you're going to commit to follow someone. You're going to commit to walk for somebody's glory. You're going to make your mark. But for what? You're going to make your mark. But for, for who? For, let me ask you this. Does your life right now in any way exemplify Jesus? Hey, you know the answer to that. Are you careful with your words? Are you Christ-like in your witness and your ways? Are you committed in your walk and your worship? Something that I want to do today as we um, close and go into a time of invitation. I truly want our students, it doesn't matter if they graduated today or they're going to graduate in five years from now, all of our children, the, the challenge today is this, commit yourself to godliness. Exemplify godliness. Exemplify a life that says that Jesus is in my life and he's in my family. And you, you have to make that commitment. That's not up to me to do. That's not up to mom and dad to do for you. That's something that you've got to do. You've got to say, I, I want to commit my life to Christ. And then parents, will you take time this morning and, and come and pray for your children specifically? You come and you, and, and you pray that Christ would be exemplified in their lives but also in your life. We want to be obedient today. Whatever the Lord's challenging you to do this morning, I pray that you would do. Robbie, would you just take time to, to play an invitation song? Um, if God's dealing with your heart, students, you, you know whether or not you exemplify Christ with your life. That's the greatest thing that you can aspire to. That's the greatest thing that you could say after graduation on Wednesday night high school is that, that I gave my life to Jesus. <laughs> that I'm serving Jesus, that I'm going to aspire to be like him with my life. And parents, that's the best thing that you can pray over your kids today is that God, help me as a parent exemplify godliness to my child. And then to pray that hedge of protection around them doesn't get any sweeter than that. Would you just take time today and commit your family to the Lord afresh and anew? If you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, today's the day of salvation. If you've never given your life to Christ, you can do that. Whatever the Lord's leading you to do today, you come. If you need to come pray at the altar, you come. Families, if you need to pray together, you pray. Just be obedient today, all right? Be obedient. You come if you need to.
Father, thank you for what you're doing today in this worship time. And Lord, I, I just praise you for the word of God um, and the obedience that has been exemplified by these parents and these children. Um, there's no greater thing that we could pray unto the Lord, for, first for salvation, but then to live for the Lord. And I, and, I, and I pray that this wouldn't be a Sunday, June 7th, 2015 thing, that we would continue to pray for our families on a daily basis, that we would continue to commit our families to the Lord in every way, from, from the things that we say to the things that we think, the things that we do. Our lives must model Jesus. And, um, and I pray that you would be found in every home. And I thank you for what we're about to celebrate uh, with two very uh, special families. I pray, Lord, that um, that you would just be glorified. And I thank you, Lord, for their obedience to you. And we love you, Lord. Thank you for what you've done today. Thank you for our graduates. Um, and, and, I, and I continue just to praise you for the work that you have done in their life and in their family. And whatever they aspire to do, whatever you're leading them to do, I pray that you would be at the center of every decision. And uh, God... Um, help us to be an example to the believers in speech, in love, in life, in faith, and in purity. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Todd, come here, buddy. Everyone, this is, this is Todd. And Todd um, Todd's a resident um, at Pavilion. And um, I'm just going to let Todd share what, what God's doing in his life. And we're going we're gonna to praise the Lord for it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, can, can we commit to pray for Todd, um, that he'll continue to walk with God? All right. Um, Todd, if you don't mind, I don't know if you have the time to, but um, could you stay up here at the end of the service and let people love on you and just encourage you? Is that good? Yes, all right. All right. What time? 12 16. 12 16. 12 16. All right. Um, Tesner family, y'all come. I've been praying for this day for a long time. <laughs> um, this is Brian and Pam and Kaylee Tesner, and um, they come today wishing to join our church family. Um, Brian, uh, Brian and Pam will be joining by letter from, from Big Level Baptist Church, and then Kaylee um, by, by statement of faith. Kaylee wants to be baptized in a river, all right? So we're going to make that happen, okay? Um, and, uh, but let's just let's continue to pray for this family. They, both, they, all, they all profess Jesus. And um, let's, let's just welcome them into the Midway home. That means you got to vote today. So what you're going to do is vote by standing on your feet. If you want Brian and Pam and Kayla to be a part of the church. See, I can't even get the sentence out. They're already up. Yeah. But um, let's just rejoice in the Lord for what he's doing. Make sure that you come by and love on them today. It's been a sweet day today, hasn't it? Continue to pray for these grads, all right? Y'all have a good day. God bless you. Mm.